Hello, I'm John Grom, and welcome to the 35th Right and Left Discussion Forum. The purpose of our discussion forum is to demonstrate that civility is the door to the arena of possibilities that leads to the fulfillment of our potential as problem solvers. Civility is more than just being quiet when someone else is talking. It's giving thoughtful consideration to their ideas and a willingness to accept them. Today our panel is going to discuss the pros and cons of the state licensing of certain professions. Our panel beginning on my left is Patty Haskins, retired math teacher and current member of the Wadsworth City Council. On her left is Brian Lawbaugh, president of R&D Financial Services. And on his left is Dr. Ronald Chamberlain, retired senior research chemist. Patty, most of us think of the state requirement of uh, licensing for the right to practice certain professions as the state protecting its citizens from incompetence, charlatans, and various kinds of quacks. However, some view it as professionals banding together to limit uh, entry into their uh, field in order to maintain a bigger share of the market. Do you think it's time for the state of Ohio, which has licensing requirements for over 200 professions, to review licensing to see that it is actually serving the public in all cases or is it sometimes just protecting the turf of certain professions? You know, when this question came up, I really wasn't <coughs> aware of the thought that licensing was there to protect the interests of certain professions. Um, and I have mixed feelings about it. Now, as a teacher, we always, now when I taught, at least for my career, I had a certificate. I did not have a license. They have a course gone to a licensing system. It's hmm. same thing, just different name, mm -hmm. but you know, different qualifications. When certification occurred, it was very easy to obtain that certification. Um, you simply had to have graduated from college with a certain major. You filled out a very short form, yeah. paid your money, and applied to the state. Without tipping anything off, what year was this? That was in 1970. Okay. So few years ago. <laughs> um, but I was only 12 at the time. So, um, very smart 12. Very smart 12, exactly. Now, the thing, I, I, and I objected to this in some ways, is that certification had to be renewed every so many years. And in order to renew it, you were required to take a certain number of hours in education, in college, in college classes. I always thought that was rather strange in as much as the classes did not have to even be associated with education. You could basically take just about anything. But you had to take, you had to be present in class, you couldn't do it by correspondence? Well, there was no such thing then. I mean, okay. there weren't online courses. <coughs> now. I think almost everyone does them, does those classes. I avoided classwork. saying online because I Does the that. online classes. Yeah. Um, and I always thought that that was kind of a ploy to make sure that uh, colleges were getting more tuition because they had this built-in group of people that had to mm. come back to school and take classes. Mm. Um, and, and there was a fee, but it was an, a nominal fee. Now, one thing that was good about it, though, is if you had taught, like for example, you started with a four-year certificate, and then after you reached certain number of years teaching and certain number of hours, you could go to an eight-year certificate mm -hmm. and then on to a permanent certificate. Um, if for every year that you taught, you did get credit for some of those hours because mm -hmm. I think experience was going to tell whether or not yeah. you were doing the job correctly. Um, the state did decide to change that program, and this was done before I retired in 2007, uh, probably eight years, I think, prior to my retirement. And they went to a licensure system, uh, and it was set up completely different. Uh, you no longer can get a permanent certificate or permanent license. Uh, they also set this up that it was actually controlled locally, that each school district had to set up a local professional development committee, mm -hmm. which, and each teacher who was trying to get their license renewed 
had to submit a plan uh, that explained exactly what they were going to take, how they were going to get their hours. And there were different ways mm -hmm. to do it. It did not have to be done just through college. You could do it by programs or, or projects that you set up within the classroom. And this was reviewed locally. Now, the only, that program only works or fails dependent upon the, the integrity of the panel that is set up in your local district. And I have to say Wadsworth is, has always been set up, I think, quite well. The thing I liked about it was that they did finally say, listen, what you're taking has to be related to not only teaching, but to what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. And you had to show in that plan that that was part of it. Yeah. And that, I think, is one of the good aspects of licensure in all professions. You know, if you are a lawyer, there are a certain number of hours that you have to take every so many years. If you're a doctor, you have to take so many hours every year. Mm -hmm. And this is so as to keep up with changes that have occurred yeah. in the profession. Uh, one of the concerns I had was the testing that is required now, because teaching has testing. Of course, we've always had the bar exam. Well, my ex-husband had to take the bar exam. My son took the CPA exam. My daughter had to take the nursing exam. And you know, I, I always wondered, you know, if you went through a four-year or six-year program to get a degree, why then does your ability to practice that profession have to depend upon a test? And, and it just seemed rather mm -hmm. odd to me. <clears throat> they can't possibly narrow in on what you're going to be working on. I mean, either the colleges aren't doing their job training and are putting out mm -hmm. substandard people, or uh, you know, they, they want to require more. I, I know with the math, uh, with the teaching license, uh, when they first introduced the exams, they had all kinds of problems the first year. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a failure rate of something like, oh, 80%. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was ridiculous. But they found there were mistakes and flaws in the tests, mm -hmm. and they had to go back and redo <laughs> them. Of course, that didn't save that teacher the, I can't yeah. remember the cost, but quite a bit of money. Yeah to retake yeah. it, so. So you didn't see the uh, licensing or certification of teachers as anything other than a way of improving the opportunities for better education in the classroom. Right, I, and I think that was the intent. Yeah. I think that okay. was the intent. It, it wasn't the National Association of Teachers uh, trying to limit the population of teachers. So, Absolutely so not. So that they keep overpaying you. And, and like I, you know, <laughs> I had never heard of this until you know, and, and I did yeah. do some reading, and it's, that yeah. is actually, in some cases, I think what they are doing. Yeah, yeah. Brian, where are you coming down on this subject? Well, um, I think that it's good to have some sort of licensing process in place to not act as a barrier to entry, but to make sure that the people that are going to practice in that particular field are qualified. Right. Um, I don't know if it's working that well. Um, I, I operate in a very, I would think, heavily regulated industry in the financial services industry. Um, I, you know, have to, my office is examined at least uh, every two years by a state examiner that comes in because of one of, you know, I'm, I'm considered a registered investment advisor for the state of Ohio. I have the necessary licenses for uh, selling securities. Um, I carry all my licenses for most financial products as far as insurances and stuff. But there's a very, I think, big uh, disparity between what's expected of someone that is doing life insurance or insurances um, and, and their standard of knowledge uh, compared to someone that's operating in the securities business. Mm -hmm. um, and what we, as I think as an industry we've seen, is that companies, individuals will give up their licensing in a particular field like securities and maintain their license in a field that is not as uh, uh, stringent. Uh, and, and to me, that, that's kind of operating around the system that's been put in place to protect mm -hmm. people. We get back to the point of protecting the general public um, from individuals that are just out there to uh, you know, take advantage of them. So we've seen this migration, if you will, of, of individuals that give up 
their licensing in a particular area because they don't want to put up with the compliance. They don't want to open their offices up to the examiner. They uh, don't want to go along with the continuing education and everything that it takes. And I'm not saying we, you know, it's that difficult, but it creates, <coughs> you know, it creates an issue for them. So they give that up and they go to another area and they continue to act as if they are in, in the area that they've just left Mm -hmm. But they and, and they do things that I don't think are in the best interest of the public. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be some fine tuning of this. If, if you're going to say that you're a doctor, you better be a doctor. Um, yeah. You know, when I go to the doctor and I see all the certificates, I want to make sure he's passed <laughs> his boards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, I, I don't I don't want to find out that he took an online course out of Jamaica that mm -hmm. qualified him to be <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, whatever he's saying he is. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I think that should apply to every industry. And, and I think there's probably too much at, at some point. We need to focus on, uh, on uh, our efforts uh, yeah. on, on making sure we do it right. Well, um, how do you think the licensing in your profession actually protects the public? I mean, uh, Bernie Madoff, uh, made off with an awful yeah. lot of other people's money and I'm sure yeah. that he was licensed. He was uh, licensed, exactly. And that's, see that's, that's the problem when people just look at a license. Uh, maybe this isn't a fair statement but you know sometimes when you get a license uh, it's just a license to steal. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's ongoing uh, uh, requirements that you should meet. Um, mm -hmm. I have several professional designations and I'm required to have so many hours of continuing education or I don't get to advertise that professional, I don't mm -hmm. care, I won't be able to carry that professional yeah. designation. Yeah. There are crooks in any business. Yeah. I mean, you can go to any particular industry and you'll find the bad apple. Um, I don't think licensing keeps those bad apples out, mm -hmm. but I think we can probably put something in place. It increases the chances of protecting the, the, uh, the, the public from right. Right. charlatans and right. so forth. Ron, where do you come down on this well, subject? I was really unaware of this as a problem until you uh, you brought up the information, began doing a little bit of reading, and uh, it hadn't really occurred to me. And I, I could see both sign of both sides of this. Several hundred years ago in Germany, there was created by merchants the Hanseatic League. The Hansia were were trade guilds, and they were in the business of protecting the public from charlatans because there was an apprenticeship. Uh, program where an individual who wanted to enter in some sort of trade or some sort of merchant profession had to go through a series of apprenticeships and then uh, they also then controlled prices, controlled entry to the profession, so not only did they protect the public from charlatans but they feathered their own nest as well. And I can see that happening in, in licensing situations. Now personally <clears throat> probably 35 years ago there was a discussion in the chemical profession about whether chemists should have professional licensings such as chemical engineers. And the debate raged for a bit in the, in the, in the literature and among those of us who were working as chemists. Uh, should we do this? Should we not do that? Is it equivalent to a union? What, what's its purpose? And my conclusion all this was we don't need that. We are not in direct, in general, chemists are not in direct uh, contact with the public. We're working for a company, we're working in a research company, and although what we do may have, well have a profound effect on society, on profound effect on individuals, we're not directly involved with them. An engineer may go out, particularly a civil engineer, may go out and design a bridge. He better know what he's doing. Uh, similarly, a chemical engineer who's designing a piece of equipment and building a factory uh, to hold some, some nasty <laughs> chemical uh, intermediate, he better know what he's doing, mm -hmm. he or she. Yeah. And uh, I think they're good and bad in that. Both we need to protect ourselves, we need to protect the public, but we have to be careful it's not doing the limitation, that there is mm -hmm. not corruption in the system, so it's just a, it's just a, a means of protecting the profession. As yeah. As someone pointed out, so it just is a way of, of, of limiting that and, and keeping the profits high for those who are in the mm -hmm. profession. Yeah. But isn't there some type of a professional society for chemists? Well, not in, in a licensing sense. There are a number of uh, things. I've been a member of, uh, of, uh, of several professional organizations, yes. Yeah. Uh, 
pay your dues and uh, you've, you've got your, uh, your educational requirements. I've been a member of uh, at least two honorary societies in chemistry, Alpha Chi Sigma and Sigma <coughs> Xi. Uh, these are ones which are, you become, get invited to join on the basis of your professional uh, career and responsibilities mm -hmm. and, and achievements. Uh, on the other hand, some of these things, uh, I'm, I'm thinking back on my oral exam for my PhD. Now, I've written the thesis, I've done the research, why do I need to stand up in front of these people and say that, yeah, I've done the research, here's what it means, you didn't understand it when you read my paper? <laughs> you <laughs> so, didn't do that, though. <laughs> no, I didn't say it that way. <laughs> but at the end of that, you walk outside the door, and they sit in there and talk about their latest golf scores, come back in, shake your head, and call you doctor. <laughs> so you're becoming a member of the club yeah. at that point. Yeah. Particularly in academia, this is very important. Not so much so in... Uh, <clears throat> in in a working environment. But, uh, you know, back to the, um, the, the societies, though, as, a as an employer, and, and, and you're a candidate, can't I take some comfort in knowing that you're a, a bona fide member of these certain organizations? Well, I think so. I can assume something about your professional <clears throat> I think, Yes, I think, I think that's true. I think that's true. I have known a couple of folks who uh, came out to work before actually completing their degree and never did complete the degree. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't looked on very kindly by yeah. the company yeah. that hired them on the basis of them having that degree. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I read in one article that we saw, though, that just because you have that license doesn't automatically make you qualified or good at your job. I think it's stated that Thomas Edison would have never been able to do the inventions and have the creativity that he had today because he wouldn't have the licensure. Uh, mm -hmm. for what he did, you know, because he did not yeah. do well in school, so. Yeah. But when I look at, uh, there are over 500 professions that are in one way or another uh, required to have a yeah. license in, in mm -hmm. one state or another. And um, the, when, I, when I look at uh, some of the things that, uh, are, or some professions that require a license, I really have to shake my head and can't think of any other reason why uh, a person should have to go through X number of hours of training and pay so, ma so many uh, uh, educational fees and uh, licensing fees and all of that to protect the public from being a bad falconer. Uh, I, <laughs> or, or, uh, I, I, or a florist. I mean, to, to me, a flower arranger is successful when somebody likes the arangement. Uh, and that, uh, you know, and if they don't like it, they don't pay for yeah. it. I mean, that's sort of self-governing. Uh, <laughs> I think professional organizations spring out of the lack of, at times, sophistication of the individual that's getting the license. Mm -hmm. So just because you sit down and you, you, you pass the test and you have a license now, does that mean that you, are, um, that you have the ability to actually do that job? Um, so then you have professional organizations um, in our industry, you know, there's a there's a variety of, uh, of of colleges, if you will, that will that over a series of you know many tests and curriculum and everything, they'll they'll allow you to use their designation. Uh, I have a couple of those, uh, but just to take the test and sit down and say, okay, I am now doing this as a profession, leaves a lot to be desired. And I think that's what happens when you know people are out there. They, they, they've passed the test, yes, they've got it hanging on the wall, you know, their, their license, but does that actually make them competent, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think of, uh, I was joking with my daughter, um, she was, when she was going through school, she was, uh, to, uh, for friends and stuff, she would cut their hair. Well, in the state that she was uh, living in, that, that, was, that, was, that was serious, I mean, because you could not do that. Um, and uh, in Ohio the, either. Yeah, I was say, hundreds. I mean, you needed hundreds of hours to get that license to cut hair, and uh, just because you were doing it for friends, and I'm not saying she was any good at it, <laughs> 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 but you see, I mean, so so in that instance, yeah. you know, people get together. You know, the beauticians and the, the, the people that cut hair as professional, they don't want people like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here's mm -hmm. what you got. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm just cynical enough that um, you're going you're gonna to love this, Brian. I, I don't understand. You know, I like to follow the money. Somebody's making money off of all these tests. Mm -hmm. And 
because they're very expensive. I think like the nursing exam was $240 a pop. And not everybody passes it the first time, so they have to come back and take, you know, spend another $240. Somebody is making money off of it. And in, in a way, here's the part you'll love, there's too much government in intervention. You never thought I, you'd hear that. I never. Did you? We have to pause <laughs> and, and have a moment. <laughs> yes. Patty, I want you to repeat that. <laughs> yes. Okay, I will repeat that. Repeat that because I, I, Patty, you what? have betrayed the cause. I'm I, I, I know. I, 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 in some areas, I think there may be too much government intervention in trying to control everything. I think yes, there's some good for the public by knowing that that person is qualified. It does not, as you said, make them good in that yeah. field. Mm -hmm. And I really think it's just making money for somebody down the road. It's a mm -hmm. source of income to the state. And uh, I mean, it's a big source of income. I pay a, a fair amount each year to renew my licenses um, on a variety of fronts. Um, and it's not $50. Um, yeah. and, and so I'm, this, this topic was well worth coming just to hear Patty <laughs> <laughs> admit yeah. that there's too much government in this particular yeah. arena mm -hmm. when it comes yes. to regulation. Uh, Ohio probably <clears throat> has fewer licenses than most other states uh, our size uh, at, uh, at 200. Uh, there are some states like New York that have a lot more than that. But the, that means that there are 200 boards uh, out there that uh, set the requirements uh, and uh, uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, who sits on these boards and uh, where do they come from? A lot of them are political appointees. Yeah. Well, they are, but most of them are people from the professions that they're regulating. Uh, and that uh, they, in, in most cases, and all the boards are different in, in, their, in how they're made up and how they're appointed, but in most cases, board members are appointed by the governor uh, on the advice and counsel of the people out of the profession that's being mm -hmm. uh, uh, governed. Well, you think about it, these are the folks that know what is needed. That's the other part of it. Now, who, yeah, who, who better Who to better do knows that? how the plumber needs to do it except the plumber? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, in, in thinking about this subject, I've uh, changed my mind uh, uh, quite a bit about things. Uh, in uh, talking to my wife uh, about uh, various things. You know, my question is, why does a hairdresser need to be licensed? And because if you don't like the way they do your hair, go to somebody that, that does it better. Well, there are certain things that a hairdresser has to know to keep from harming you. Uh, in, in fact, uh, nails, I see you get your nails done oh, by, yes. by somebody that knows how to not cause infections in your fingers Hopefully, and, yes. and create funguses. And uh, so, well, you walk in and you see the license and you know this person has at least been taught how to avoid causing these in, infections and so forth. On the other hand, in most boards, there's at least one person who does not come out of the industry that represents the ignorant public. Uh, mm -hmm. And that uh, would, well, yes, they, uh, we are ignorant about the intricacies of each, uh, each profession, but we're the ones that have to be protected. Uh, and, and so I think that uh, while there are probably a lot of uh, licensing requirements that are there to do nothing more than protect the market of the uh, individuals that are involved uh, by controlling the amount of people that come into the profession. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, also when you think about uh, professions where somebody's body, whether it's a, a, a massage therapist or <coughs> a hairdresser, when you're, you're physically being worked on, there That's are ways fine. that you can be harmed uh, through ignorance of. But I think the point needs to be made is that <coughs> that license gives that person basically the bare minimum as far as experience and dealing with it. Um, uh, I think people need to have experience. I think the idea of having an apprentice program right. in place, uh, you know, uh, there's a big difference between being licensed to cut somebody's hair, or being licensed to uh, provide, you know, some, you know, surgery or something. But just to have a license doesn't mean that you are actually prepared to do that. I, I mean, I think back yeah. 25 or so years when I first was licensed, uh, I got a Series 7. Uh, I knew enough to get through the test. I got through the test, but there was a lot that I still had to learn. Mm -hmm. And just to hang yourself on that <clears throat> license um, 
and saying that you're, you know, you're, you're in business. And, and I, I just don't think that that's, that's what people expect. I'm thinking about it on medical procedures. If you go to surgery, ask the surgeon, how many of these have you done? Right. Uh, mm -hmm. My wife had some surgery some years ago, and uh, she asked its doctor, and he says, well, nobody's done very many of these operations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. she trusted it and went ahead, mm -hmm. and it was very successful. So, but, uh, but that surgeon, in Ron's example, that surgeon had, had gone had through uh, uh, how many years of residency? Oh, yes. Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, and somebody had to be first. So, so yeah, first. Someone, <laughs> some, yeah, yeah, someone's looking over somewhere. his shoulder. Yeah. Someone's there with them. <laughs> you know, making sure that he does everything right. And I had my uh, haircut once by a fellow who was going to barber school, and it took about <laughs> it took about forty five minutes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, if licensing doesn't guarantee results, uh, but it improves no. your odds, I right. believe. Uh, and I, I feel more comfortable seeing a license on the wall. And knowing that somebody has filled certain requirements, uh, in, instead of they just decided one day I want to be a brain right. surgeon. And but do you have to pass <laughs> that test for the licensing when you you know, if you are a teacher, you've graduated from college, you have that teaching degree. Mm -hmm. Why do you then need to take a test for a license when that university yeah. has already said when you've yeah. when you've passed you know when you've gone to beauty school exam. and you passed <laughs> that. Why do you then have to take yeah. another test? But what I would be in favor of yeah. instead of a license is more of a certification process that says, okay, over this period, okay, you start teaching. Over this period of time, we'd like to see you go from this particular knowledge base and keeping up with continuing mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. and see, everything. That's a big thing, I think. You know, yes. uh, pay for that. Uh, and so that at the end of the day, we have a, a, a better pool of people instead of saying, mm -hmm. okay, you've, you've got to pay the dues yeah. to be right. a teacher. Yeah. Well, I have to tell you, after spending 40 years as an executive recruiter, there were times that I wished that there was a licensing requirement to limit the number of executive recruiters that came into the business. It seemed yeah. like every VP of human resources that got downsized wanted to become a headhunter. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and all you needed to do was say you were a headhunter and uh, you were in business. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very uh, stimulating conversation. It turned out better than I thought that it would. I'd like to leave you with a couple of quotes. <laughs> <clears throat> then uh, this is from Dwight Curry. He is an author and bookstore owner in Vermont. We have a choice about how we behave. That means that we have the choice to opt for civility and grace. And this from Robert Fulgham. Robert said, play fair, don't hit people, and say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. That's from everything I needed to know I learned in kindergarten. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>